Welcome to another episode of In the Time It Takes to Make the Coffee. This is for the Drafting 2 class, which essentially is corridor design within Civil 3D, but it's more importantly corridor and site design within 3D, um, the world. So first let's go through, I'll lay down the steps here and I'm going to expect you all to fill in with the annotation, the steps to making a tin. Obviously you have to go out and get your points. It's not always points that you go out and get. Sometimes you can just go out and get a digital elevation model or some other set of data. Sorry for that tick there. You begin a civil 3D project. Before you begin the Civil 3D project, you need to set your environment right in the DOS or Linux or whatever environment you're at. So make sure that you have all your settings right in terms of Windows. Particularly, that means at MidState, making sure that your K drive is mapped to the standards AutoCAD directory. You then open or start Civil 3D through the front door if it's a new project. You make a new project from the correct, we'll call it template or seed file will be better as we start using the DOT files. You immediately set the scale and things like that for the project and the project settings, but while you're doing that, you also set up your coordinate system. And we pretty much shoot in State Plane Central, but if we're working with data from um, Wisconsin Rapids, I think, has their own coordinate system, which is based in, this, in Rapids, basically. You might be using Wood County. You might be using Portage County. You might be using UTM-16. You might be using Lat Long, but we pretty much stick with State Plain Central. You then import the points, and it's not import survey data, but many other organizations would be using the survey function on this and I think we will eventually we'll see what the DOT does but you import points and you make sure that when you import them they're in the PNEZD setting and you'll see the great thing about working in state plane central or any coordinate system that's laid out is your northings and eastings should be far enough off that when you bring something in it's you'll notice by looking at it that it's flipped 90 degrees and flipped around so you you import your points and then you go through very often many of us just go ahead and make a tin to see what it looks like but we're not going to talk about that right now the next step is to do your line work from node to node and this will be the first time you'll see me typically go and turn on the object snaps which I believe often are a problem for people to have on you draft up all your line work, uh, and typically you're going to need to make those polylines. You make those polylines, and I generally don't use the feature command, feature line command, but there's a value to that as well. You make them polylines, and that makes them 2D polylines. You now have a bunch of points. You probably had point groups made right in the middle there. If you remember, you want to make point groups. And those probably came in automatically off of your description keys on the import. But if not, different point groups and different visibilities will help you to do that line work from node to node by turning them on and off. Uh, so you can do that line work. All right. Once they are polylines, you're going to make them, you want to make them polyline so that when you go through this process to make a surface you're okay. The next thing you do is you go ahead and create a surface. So you have to go to surfaces and right click and say new. Then you go to down to that surface and you immediately rename it to something that makes sense. In this class we will give you codes to begin most of your data structure names, your file names and everything. Usually it's going to be something like existing topo or existing ground or existing clay or whatever it is. You're going to use usually an existing. Again, we will check the DOT standards, but you rename this rename. This naming of things is incredibly important. You then go and 
add point data by particular groups. You then add break lines, and I believe it's polylines by proximity or something like that. You can take a look at it. Perhaps you can do the discussion here on this board right here. The last thing you want to do is you want to have a two-dimensional polyline drafted around for a boundary. Once again, it's not completely necessary, but you want to have those boundaries. They should be 2D closed polylines, and you need them basically out on the edges so you don't makes it easier so the program does not throw tin lines between points that should not have them. And you need them on places like interior buildings or water surfaces where you do not want it to draw those uh, triangles because the water surface is pretty much flat uh, unless the wind's blowing and a uh, building pad is pretty much flat a parking lot is not flat a roof is generally not flat so sometimes they are flat roofs are not all flat they usually have a little bit of a gray to them but floors building pads are generally flat and you can see out at mid-state the general tolerance up and down is pretty good this building is all on one elevation now the other building I'm sorry the major building is all on one elevation one of the other buildings kind of drops down a little bit I think okay so what you've done is you have imported your points put them into point groups drawn lines and then they made polylines out of them made break lines you have created a surface you have renamed it you have then gone and added data you have added the point groups you added the the break lines and the boundary and then you I believe it says generate surface or create surface you go ahead and make it and your tin is done you check it of course a couple of different ways we love their water drop tins have to be really good to really show your water drop we turn it so you can see triangles and then you use some 3d views and things like that you use quick cross sections right uh, there's lots of different ways to check your tin, but you want to do it. You can use data, and you're ch particularly checking for spikes or holes in the data or holes that kind of go down, that go up. There will be where you blew a rod. Someone blew a rod. You might not have been the one shooting it. It will be where um, you shot the, the benchmark of a hydrant. That would be probably a flange nut or maybe the top nut. It might be someplace where you had to get something... Uh, at a building corner where you couldn't necessarily get your rod down to where it needed to be but you were picking up the horizontal data very typically it will be something that someone was really trying to get a good job on either just vertical or a good job on just horizontal and they blew the other one uh, or with with rods it's very often um, not just the ones that you blew the rod you, you, you raised the rod for a while and you were supposed to put it back down and you didn't or something like that. So you're looking for that and you clean it up. That is making a tin. I'll keep going. I'll make the 15 minutes since this is actually a review video uh, and it's going to be something that you all can mark up and I'm, I will expect you to do that. Now let's look at how you basically design a road off that tin digital or that digital train model uh, on paper and this paper translates directly into most programs here's the steps you get something plotted to scale a scale that can be read on an engineering scale 10 20 30 40 50 60 100 200 300 400 500 600 1000 those are standard engineering scales 1 2 3 4 5 6 10 standard engineering scales you lay out with your north arrow, you make sure that you know your vertical datum and your horizontal datum. In other words, your horizontal coordinate system. I believe we shot in NGVD88, and we're in the state plane central. That might be a little bit different. You might be going off of a, um, a Harn benchmark, but it's pretty close. But we should know what you shot. You should know what you shot. It should be on the plan. A north arrow should be on the plan. Um, any other number of things and you'll realize this goes back to sketching where you define your datum you can do it verbally state plane central alright you mark up your horizontal constraints and your vertical constraints but mostly your horizontal constraints you then draw your proposed alignment with straight tangents I would say do not put your curves in 
nor will you do it in symbol 3D to start, with straight tangents. <clears throat> you then start your stationing, usually in the west and in the south, and you do not begin at 0 plus 0, 0. You start probably around 10 plus 0, 0. And if you have many, many different alignments, you try not to have any overlap in the numbers. So you go, might, one might go from 10 plus 0, 0 to 17 plus 0, 0. You probably step, start that next one at 20 plus 0, 0. You label the major uh, stations, so 10 plus 0, 0, 20 plus 0, 0, 30 plus 0, 0. You then, smartly, you don't have to do this in a table, you sketch in right there at each of those tick marks what the existing grade is, the existing grade. You mark that down. You can do this in a table as well as what we did in class. You then look at it and start thinking about what your proposed grades will be. You don't necessarily do this on a graph or on a table. You're sitting there with a calculator in your brain and thinking about approximate grades as you learn vertical. So you have at every little tiny station there, you have a proposed and an existing elevation. Usually one is off to one side and one is off to the other uh, when you're doing this by hand, but you have an existing and proposed. You now, pretty much once you've done that, you're going to get very close. You won't have your vertical curve data in there. At that point, right, you have really an existing and a proposed vertical at this point in time. You had an existing and a proposed horizontal. I'm sorry, the existing horizontal was what it was, or it wasn't, didn't exist, and you just have a proposed horizontal. That's your alignment. The next step, or maybe the first step, was to have a typical section drafted at one to one. And the typical section we used in class was 10 feet wide and then a one to one slope down. You draft that up, those three things together, all that together gets you your design. Your design is pretty much done and you can go from there. Learn to do that on paper quickly. Learn to do it in CAD, a non super engine like Civil 3D. Learn to do it in SketchUp or AutoCAD. And we'll see how quickly that goes in Civil 3D. And from there, iterating design is tough on paper sometimes. Not so tough. It's extremely kind of crazy wild cool in Civil 3D. We'll talk about targets. We'll talk about multiple alignments, multiple verticals, but the key to most things in engineering is that you can do them quickly, somewhat roughly, on the back of an envelope or on a sheet of paper. And that's what we did this week. This ties back primarily to skills that you might or might not have gained in uh, estimating, but all the way through your program here as we start getting to these standards of what scale we draft at. So remember, a standard engineering scale, civil engineering scale, is any scale that can be read on with a standard engineering scale. Thanks for listening. Coffee's done.